that's what's happening now uh, in uh, AFPAC, Afghanistan and Pakistan, as the regions are now called. Uh, Obama is building enormous new embassies and other facilities on the model of uh, the city within a city in Baghdad. Uh, these are like no embassies anywhere in the world. Uh, and, in, uh, and they are signs of an intention to be there for a long time. Uh, right now in Iraq, something interesting is happening. Obama's pressing the Iraqi government not to permit the referendum that's required by the Status of Forces Agreement. That's an agreement that was forced down the throats of the Bush administration, which had to formally renounce its primary war aims in the face of uh, massive Iraqi resistance. Uh, the uh, uh, Washington's current objection to the referendum was explained two days ago by New York Times correspondent Alyssa Rubin. Uh, Obama fears that the Iraqi population might reject the provision that delays U.S. troop withdrawal to 2012. Uh, they might insist on immediate departure of U.S. forces. Uh, Iraqi analyst in London. Uh, uh, the Iraq head of the Iraqi Foundation for Democracy and Development in London, it's quite pro-Western, uh, he explained, this is an election year for Iraq. No one wants to appear that he's appeasing the Americans. Anti-Americanism is popular now in Iraq, as indeed it's been throughout. In fact, they're familiar to anyone who's read the Western-run polls, including Pentagon-run polls. Well, the current U.S. efforts to prevent the legal, to prevent the legally required referendum uh, are extremely revealing. Uh, some, sometimes they're called democracy promotion. Well, while Obama's signaling very clearly his intention to establish a firm and large-scale presence in the region, he's also, as you know, sharply escalating the AFPAC war following Petraeus' strategy to drive the Taliban into Pakistan with potentially awful results for this extremely dangerous and unstable state which is facing insurrections throughout its territory. Uh, these are the most extreme in the tribal areas which cross the AFPAC border. It's an artificial line imposed by the British called the uh, uh, Durand Line and the same people live on both sides of it, Pashtun tribes, and they've never accepted it. Uh, 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 and in fact, the Afghan, Afghanistan government never accepted it either, as long as it was independent. Uh, well, that's where most of the fighting's going on. Uh, one of the leading specialists on the region, Zelik Harrison, uh, he recently wrote that the outcome of Washington's current policies, Obama's policies, might well be what he calls an Islamic Pashtunistan, Pashtun-based separate kind of quasi-state. Uh, the Pakistani ambassador had warned that if the Taliban and Pashtun nationalism merge, we've had it and we're on the verge of that. Uh, the prospects become still more ominous with the escalation of drone attacks that embitter the population with their huge civilian toll, and more recently, uh, just a couple of days ago in fact, with the unprecedented authority that has just been granted to General Stanley McChrystal, who's taking charge. He's a kind of a wild-eyed special forces assassin who's been put in charge of heading the operations. Uh, Petraeus' own counterinsurgency advisor in Iraq, David General David Bill Cullen, Colonel, I think, uh, he describes the uh, obama petraeus uh, uh, McChrystal policies as a fundamental strategic error which may lead to the collapse of Pakistan. He says it's a calamity that would dwarf all other current issues given the country's size, strategic location, and nuclear stockpile. It's also not too encouraging that Pakistan and India are now rapidly expanding their nuclear arsenals. 
Uh, Pakistan's nuclear arsenals were developed with Reagan's crucial aid. And uh, India's nuclear weapons program has got a major shot in the arm uh, with the recent uh, U.S.-India nuclear agreement. It's also a sharp blow to the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, two countries have twice come close to nuclear war over Kashmir, and they're also engaged in a kind of a proxy war in Afghanistan. Uh, these developments pose a very serious threat to world peace, uh, even to human survival. Well, a lot to say about this crisis, but no time here. Uh, coming back home, uh, whether the deceit here about the monstrous enemy was sincere or not, Johnson's case might well have been sincere. Uh, suppose that, say, 50 years ago, Americans had been given a choice of directing their tax money to development of information technology so that their grandchildren could have uh, iPods and the Internet, or else putting the same funds into developing a liver livable and sustainable socioeconomic order. Well, they might very well have made the latter choice, but they had no choice. Now, that's standard. There's a striking gap between public opinion and public policy on a host of major issues, domestic and foreign. And at least in my judgment, public opinion is often a lot more sane. Uh, it also tends to be fairly consistent over time, which is pretty astonishing. Uh, because public concerns and aspirations, if they're even mentioned, are marginalized and ridiculed. It's one very significant feature of the yawning uh, democratic deficit, as we call it in other countries. That's the failure of formal democratic institutions to function properly. And that's no trivial matter. Uh, Arundhati Roy has a book soon to come out in which she asks whether the evolution of formal democracy in India and the United States, in fact, not only there, her words, might turn out to be the end game of the human race. And that's not an idle question. Uh, it should be recalled that the American Republic was founded on the principle that there should be a democratic deficit. Uh, James Madison, the main framer of the constitutional order, uh, his view was that uh, Power should be in the hands of the wealth of the nation, the more responsible set of men who have sympathy for property owners and their rights. Uh, and Madison sought to construct a system of government that would, in his words, protect the minority of the opulent from the majority. Uh, that's why the constitutional system that he framed did not have co-equal uh, branches. The executive was supposed to be an administrator, and the legislature was supposed to be dominant, but not the House of Representatives, rather the Senate, where power was vested and protected from the public in many ways. That's where the wealth of the nation would be concentrated. This is not overlooked by historians. Gordon Wood, for example, summarizes the thoughts of the founders, saying that the Constitution was intrinsically an aristocratic document designed to check the democratic tendencies of the period, uh, delivering power to a better sort of people and excluding those who were not rich, well-born, or prominent from exercising political power. All through American history, there's been a constant struggle over this constrained version of democracy. And uh, popular struggles have won a great many rights. Nevertheless, concentrated power and privilege clings to the Madisonian conception, changes form as circumstances change. Uh, it, by World War II, there was a significant change. Uh, business leaders and elite intellectuals uh, recognized that the public had won enough rights uh, so that they can't be controlled by force. Uh, so it would be necessary to do something else, namely to turn to control of uh, attitudes and opinion. Now, these were the days when the huge public relations industry emerged in the freest countries in the world, Britain and the United States, where the problem was most severe. Uh, the public relations industry was devoted to what uh, 
Walter Lippmann approvingly called a new art in the practice of democracy, uh, the manufacture of consent. It's called the engineering of consent in the phrase of his, his contemporary Edward Bernays, one of the founders of the PR industry. Uh, both Lippmann and Bernays had taken part in Woodrow Wilson's state propaganda agency, uh, which uh, Committee on Public Information was its Orwellian term. Uh, it was created to kind of to try to drive a pacifist population uh, to jingoist fanaticism and hatred of all things German, and it succeeded brilliantly, in fact. And it was hoped that the same techniques uh, could uh, ensure that what are called the intelligent minorities would rule uh, and that the general public, who Lippmann called ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, uh, would uh, serve their function as spectators, not participants. These are all very highly respected progressive essays on democracy by people who, by a man who was the leading public intellectual of the 20th century and was a Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy progressive, as Bernays was. Uh, and uh, they capture the thinking of progressive opinion. So President Wilson, uh, he held an elite of gentlemen with elevated ideals must be empowered to preserve stability and righteousness, essentially the perspective of the founding fathers. Uh, in more recent years, the uh, gentlemen are transmuted into the technocratic elite and the uh, action intellectuals of Camelot, uh, Straussian, neocons, uh, other configurations, but throughout one or another variant of the doctrine prevails. The quote from Samuel Huntington that you heard as an example. Uh, and on a more hopeful note, the popular struggle continues to clip its wings quite impressively in the wake of 1960s activism, which had quite a substantial effect on civilizing the society and raised the prospects for further progress to a much higher plane. It's one of the reasons why it's called the time of troubles and bitterly denounced. Too much of a civilizing effect. Well, what the West sees as the crisis, namely the financial crisis, now, that'll presumably be patched up somehow or other, but leaving the institutions that created it pretty much in place. A couple of days ago, the Treasury Department, as you read, permitted early TARP repayments, uh, which uh, actually reduce capacity. I mean, it was touted as giving money back to the public. In fact, as was pointed out right away, it reduces the capacity of banks to lend although it does allow them to pour money into the pockets of uh, the few who matter. And the mood in, on Wall Street was captured by two Bank of New York employees who predicted that their lives and pay would improve uh, even if the broader economy did not. That's paraphrasing Adam Smith's observation that the architects of policy protect their own interests and how, no matter how grievous the effect on others. And they are the architects of policy. Obama made sure to staff his economic advisors from that sector, uh, the, uh, which has been pointed out to the former uh, uh, chief economist of the IMF, uh, Sam, Simon Johnson, uh, pointed out that the Obama administration is just in the pocket of Wall Street. Uh, as he put it, throughout the crisis, the government has taken extreme care not to upset the interests of the financial institutions or to question the basic outlines of the system that got us here and the elite business interests who played a central role in creating the crisis uh, with the implicit backing of the government, uh, they're still there and they're now using their influence to prevent precisely the set of reforms that are needed and fast to pull the economy out of its nosedive. He says the economy, the government seems helpless or unwilling to act against them, which is no surprise considering who constitutes and who backs the government. Well, uh, there's a far more severe crisis, even for the rich and powerful. 
it happens to be discussed in the same issue of the New York Review that I mentioned, article by Bill McKibben. He's been warning for years about the dire impact of global warming. Uh, his current article, worth reading, it relies on the British Stern Report, which is sort of the gold standard now. Uh, on this basis, he concludes, not unrealistically, that 2009 uh, may well turn out to be the decisive year in the human relationship with our home planet. Now, the reason is that there's a, a conference in December in Copenhagen, which is supposed to set up a new global accord on global warming, and he says it's, uh, it'll tell us whether or not our political systems are up to the unprecedented challenge that climate change represents. Now, he thinks that the signals are mixed. T to me, that seems kind of optimistic, unless there's really a massive uh, public campaign to overcome the insistence of the managers of the state corporate sector on privileging short-term gain for the few uh, over the hope that their grandchildren uh, might have a decent future. Well, the picture could be a lot more grim even than the Stern Report predicts, and that's grim enough. A couple of days ago, a group of uh, MIT scientists released the results of what they describe as the most comprehensive modeling yet carried out on the likelihood of how much hotter the Earth's climate will get in this century, which shows that without rapid and massive action, the problem will be about twice as severe as previously estimated a couple of years ago. And it could be even worse than that, because their model does not fully incorporate uh, positive feedbacks that can occur. For example, the increased temperature that is causing a, a, a melting of permafrost in uh, the Arctic regions which is going to release uh, huge amounts of methane. It's worse than CO2. Uh, the leader of the project says there's no way the world can or should take these risks. He says the least cost option to lower the risk is to start now and steadily transform the global energy system over the coming decades to low or zero greenhouse gas emitting technologies. And there's very little sign of that. Well, furthermore, while new technologies are essential, uh, the problems go well beyond that. In fact, they go beyond the current technical debates about just how to work out cap-and-trade devices being discussed in Congress. We have to face something much more far-reaching. We have to face up to the need to reverse the huge state corporate social engineering projects of the post-Second World War period which very consciously promote, <laughs> I mean, they very consciously uh, uh, promoted an energy wasting and environmentally destructive fossil fuel economy. It didn't happen by accident. Uh, that's the whole massive project of suburbanization, then uh, destruction and later gentrification of inner cities. Uh, the state corporate program uh, began with a conspiracy by General Motors, Firestone Rubber, Standard Oil of California, uh, to buy up and destroy efficient electric transportation systems in Los Angeles and dozens of other cities. Uh, they were actually convicted of criminal conspiracy and given a tap on the wrist, like a $5,000 fine. Uh, the federal government then took over. It, relocated infrastructure and capital stock to subur suburban areas and also created a huge interstate highway system under the usual pretext of defense. Uh, railroads were displaced by government financed uh, motor and air transport. Uh, the public played almost no role apart from choosing within the narrowly structured framework of options that are designed by state corporate managers. Uh, they're supported by vast campaigns to uh, fabricate consumers with created wants, borrowing Veblen's terms. Uh, one result is the atomization 
of the society and the entrapment of isolated individuals with huge debts. Uh, these efforts grew out of the recognition that I mentioned a century ago that democratic achievements have to be curtailed by shaping attitudes and uh, uh, beliefs. As the business press put it, directing people to superficial things of life like fashionable consumption. Uh, all of that's necessary to ensure that the opulent minority are protected from uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, namely the population. If I just add a personal note on that, I came down here this afternoon by the Acela, you know, the jewel and the crown of new uh, rail, high-speed railroad technology. Uh, the first time I came from Boston to New York was 60 years ago, and there was improvement since then. It was five minutes faster today than it was 60 years ago. While, while state corporate power was vigorously promoting the privatization of life and maximal waste of energy, it was also undermining the efficient choices that the market doesn't and can't provide. That's another highly destructive built-in market inefficiency. So to put it simply, if I want to get home from work you know, in the evening, uh, the market does allow me a choice between, say, a Ford and a Toyota, but it doesn't allow me a choice between a car and a subway, which would be much more inefficient. And maybe everybody wants it, but the market doesn't allow that choice. And that's a social decision. And in a democratic society, it would be the decision of an organized public. But that's just what the elite attack on democracy seeks to undermine. Now, these consequences are right before our eyes in ways that are sometimes surreal. A couple of weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal had an article reporting that the U.S. transportation chief is in Spain. He's meeting with high-speed rail suppliers. Uh, Europe's engineering and rail companies are lining up uh, for some potentially lucrative U.S. contracts for high-speed rail projects. At stake is $13 billion in stimulus funds that the Obama administration is allocating to upgrade existing rail lines and build new ones that would one day rival Europe's. So think what's happening. Spain and other European countries are hoping to get U.S. taxpayer funding for high-speed rail and related infrastructure. And at the very same time, Washington is busy dismantling leading sectors of U.S. industry, ruining the lives of workers and communities who could easily do it themselves. Uh, it's pretty hard to conjure up a more damning indictment of the economic system that's been constructed by state corporate managers. Surely the auto industry could be reconstructed to produce what the country needs using its highly skilled workforce. Uh, and, uh, but, but that's not even, not even on the agenda. It's not even being discussed. Rather, we'll go to Spain and we'll give them taxpayer money for them to do it while we destroy the capacity to do it here. Uh, it's been done before. Uh, so during World War II, it was kind of a semi-command economy, government-organized economy. Uh, uh, the, ho the whole, uh, uh, that's what happened. The industry was reconstructed for the purposes of war dramatically. It not only ended the depression, but uh, it initiated the most spectacular uh, period of growth in economic history. Uh, in four years, U.S. industrial production just about quadrupled, and that as the economy was retooled for war, and that laid the basis for the golden age that followed. Well, warnings about the purposeful destruction of U.S. productive capacity have been familiar for decades, maybe most prominently by the late Seymour Melman, who many of us knew well. Uh, Melman was also one of those who pointed the way to a sensible way to reverse the project, uh, the process. Uh, this state corp corporate leadership, of course, has other commitments, 
But there's no reason for passivity on the part of the public, the so-called stakeholders, workers, and community. I mean, with enough popular support, they could just take over the plant and carry out the task of restricted construction themselves. It's not, it's not a very exotic proposal. Uh, one of the standard texts uh, on corporations in the economics literature points out that nowhere is it written in stone that the short-term interests of corporate sh shareholders in the United States uh, uh, in the United States deserve a higher priority than all other corporate stakeholders, workers, and community. That's a state corporate decision. It has nothing to do with economic theory. It's also important to remind ourselves that the notion of workers' control is as American as apple pie. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the, I'm kind of impressed, but it's there. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution in uh, New England, uh, working people just took it for granted that those who work in the mills should own them. And they also regarded wage labor uh, as different from slavery, only in that it was temporary. Uh, also Abraham Lincoln's view. Uh, the, uh, there have been immense efforts to drive these thoughts out of people's heads uh, to win what the business world calls the everlasting battle for the minds of men. Uh, on the surface, they may appear to have succeeded. But I don't think you have to dig too deeply to find out that they're latent and they can be revived. And there have been some important concrete efforts. Uh, one of them was undertaken 30 years ago in Youngstown, Ohio, where U.S. Steel was going to shut down a major facility that was at the heart of this uh, steel town. And there were substantial protests by the workforce and by the community. Uh, then there was an effort led by Stoughton Lind to bring to the courts the principle that stakeholders should have the highest priority. Well, the effort failed that time, but with enough popular support, it could succeed. And right now is a propitious time to revive such efforts, although it would be necessary, and we have to do this, to overcome the effects of this concentrated campaign to drive our own history and culture out of our minds. There was a very dramatic illustration of the success of this campaign just a few months ago. Uh, in February, President Obama decided to show his solidarity with working people. Uh, he went to Illinois to give a talk at a factory. The factory he chose was the Caterpillar Corporation. Now that was over the strong objections of church groups, uh, peace groups, human rights groups, uh, who protested, were protesting Cal Caterpillar's role in providing what amount to weapons of mass destruction in the Israeli-occupied territories. Apparently forgotten, however, was something else. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, after Reagan had uh, dismantled the Air Traffic Controllers Union, the Caterpillar managers decided to rescind their labor contract with the United Auto Workers and to destroy the union by bringing in scabs to break a strike. That was the first time that it happened in generations. Now that practice is illegal in other industrial countries, apart from South Africa at the time. Uh, not now. Now the United States is in splendid isolation as far as I'm aware. Well, at that time, Obama was a civil rights lawyer in Chicago. And he certainly read the Chicago Tribune which ran quite a good, very careful study of these events. They reported that the union was stunned to find that unemployed workers crossed the picket line with no remorse, while Caterpillar workers found little moral support in their community. This is one of the many communities where the union had lifted the standard of living for entire communities. Uh, wiping out these memories is another victory in the relentless campaign to destroy workers' rights and democracy, which is constantly waged by the highly class-conscious business classes. Now, the union leadership had refused to understand. Uh, it was only in 
1978 that uh, UAW President uh, Doug Fraser recognized what was happening uh, and uh, criticized the leaders of the business community, I'm quoting him, for, for waging a one-sided class war in this country, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young and the very old, and even many in the middle class of our society, and for having broken and discarded the fragile, unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress. That was 1979. And in fact, placing one's faith in a compact with owners and managers is a suicide pact. The UAW is discovering that right now as the state corporate leadership uh, proceeds to eliminate the uh, hard-fought gains of working people while dismantling the productive core of the economy and uh, sending the transportation secretary to Spain to, to get them to do what uh, American workers could do at taxpayer expense, of course. Well, that's only a fragment of what's underway, and it highlights the uh, importance of short and long-term strategies to uh, build and in part resurrect the foundations of a functioning democratic society. Uh, one short-term goal is to revive a strong independent labor movement. Uh, in its heyday, it was a critical base for advancing democracy and human and civil rights. Uh, it's a primary reason why it's been subjected to such unremitting attack and policy and propaganda. Uh, an immediate goal right now is to pressure Congress to permit organizing rights, the Employer Free Choice Act legislation. That is, uh, That was promised, but now seems to be languishing. And a longer-term goal is to win the educational and cultural battle that's been waged with such bitterness in the one-sided class war that the UAW president perceived far too late. That means tearing apart an enormous edifice of delusions about uh, markets, free trade, and democracy that's been assiduously constructed over many years and to overcome the marginalization and atomization of the public. Uh, of all the crises that afflict us, I think my own feeling is that this growing democratic deficit may be the most severe. Uh, unless it's reversed, uh, Arundhati Roy's forecast might prove accurate and not in the distant future. Uh, the conversion of democracy to a performance in which the public are only spectators uh, might well lead to inexorably to what she calls the end game for the human race.